afternoon, everyone. I call this meeting of the Committee on Workforce and Business Development to order. Uh, please, uh, members, uh, mute your mics. Uh, the, this meeting is being conducted pursuant to Rule 10.01. This remote hearing can be viewed at House Television webcast. The Committee Legislative uh, Assistant, uh, Mr. Chavez, will now take the role. Chair Noor. Present. Chair Noor, present. Vice Chair Jay Jong. Present. Vice Chair Jay Jong, present. Lead Hamilton. Present. Lead Hamilton, present. Baker. Baker. Davney. Davney. Frankie. Present. Frankie. Frankie present. Beanman. Present. Beanman present. Haley. Haley. Present. Haley present. Jurgens. Jurgens present. Jurgens present. Kegel. Present. Kegel present. Katiza Watun. Present. Katiza Watun present. Olson. Present. Olson present. Tujong. Present. Tujong present. Baker, Baker, Davney, Davney. Mr. Chair, we have quorum. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chavez. Uh, there's a quorum present. Uh, Vice Chair Jay Zhong, will you move the minutes for March uh, first? So move, Mr. Chair. Vice Chair Jay Zhong moves the, the approval for the minutes uh, for March 1st, 2021. Any discussion? Any discussions? See none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? See none, uh, the motion prevails. Uh, the minutes for March 1st is now approved. Uh, members, we do have uh, two bills today, but uh, we have many people who are going to be testifying on the bills. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that uh, we pay attention to the time. Uh, I wanna make sure everyone has a chance to speak on this bills that are before us. I know many people are passionate about the issues we're going to be talking about, but I wanted to caution that time is uh, of essence. So I would like to start with the house, uh, the bill for the redevelopment and MIF and JC. Uh, Representative Kego, will you please move your bill and uh, uh, tell us about it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move that House File 819 be laid over for possible inclusion. And please proceed, uh, Representative Kegel, and tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. House File 819 focuses our attention on some of the core programs of the Department of Employment and Economic Development that support business development and job creation in communities all across the state of Minnesota. The three programs featured in this bill are the Minnesota Investment Fund, the Job Creation Fund, and the Redevelopment Account. The primary focus of this legislation is to establish base level funding to ensure that the continued success of these programs. We are hoping that the budget target that this committee ultimately receives will allow for maintaining the funding levels that have been in place for the Minnesota Investment Fund and the Job Creation Fund, and will allow us to establish base level funding for the Redevelopment Account. I have with me representatives from the Economic Development Association of Minnesota and the Metropolitan Municipalities who have worked on these programs and would like to share with you how important they are to have been helping grow jobs in Minnesota. Our first witness is Charlie Vanderarty from the from Minnesota Cities. Uh, then we will hear from Lesur, Fridley, and Worthington, where we have seen real success with the support from DEED programs, and there are several additional testimonies on the success of these programs and the materials prepared by EDAM and, include, and are included in your packets. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that we hear from our witnesses and then we can, and then I can stand for any questions. Um, Mr. Addy, uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record uh, and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I am Charlie Vanderarty for Metro Cities, which represents the collective interests of cities across the seven county metropolitan region at the legislature, executive branch, and the Metropolitan Council. We thank Representative Cagle for introducing this local jobs and tax base bill. 
The three funds in House File 819 are Minnesota's response to the global competition that exists for where businesses choose to make investments, while other states invest hundreds of millions of dollars in job attraction efforts. Minnesota's longstanding and relatively modest investments mean good paying jobs for workers in the Minnesota communities where capital investments are made. The Minnesota Investment Fund and Job Creation Fund are pipeline programs, which means cities in the state are responding at the speed of business. You'll hear from local economic development city practitioners about how cities work with the private sector to grow local economies. While the Job Creation Fund and Minnesota Investment Fund are part of the base budget the legislature passed in 2019, today I will highlight the benefits of the Redevelopment Grant Program, which is not in the base budget. $8 million would fund $1 million to the Metro and $1 million to Greater Minnesota during each of DEED's grant rounds, which take place twice a year. Redevelopment is economic development for many communities, but for creative reuse of brownfield sites, new buildings would not be built community needs would not be met, and local workers not employed. Redevelopment is the starting line for so many projects, not just in the metro, but statewide. I point you to the community benefits, environmental benefits, and economic benefits of Brownfield Redevelopment Handout. When brownfields are redeveloped, neighborhoods become more connected, the health risks associated with air and water pollutants and inactivity decrease, and transportation options become more widely available. And redevelopment means jobs three times. The first is during demolition and remediation. The second is during construction. And the third source are the final and ongoing jobs that a new development creates. Metro Cities encourages the committee to include an appropriation for the redevelopment grant program, as well as MIF and JCF. Thank you for your consideration, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. The next person I have is DiMaggio. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with, the, with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Noor. My name is Samantha DiMaggio. I am the Community Development Director in the City of Lesseur. In the 1970s, the city was awarded federal funds from the Housing and Redevelopment Program as part of an urban renewal project. These funds were used to demolish one full block of the City of Lesseur in our core downtown. They then partnered with a developer who agreed to build a 93,000 square foot mall in the middle of Lesseur. I was not in Lesseur in the 70s, but it appears that what happened was the developer, based on the size building that he wanted to build, he needed to find some more land to accommodate the size plus the parking. So the city agreed to close off our main street. By doing this, we literally divided our community. Fast forward 40 years later and people's shopping habits have changed. We now have more online retailers and people, they're just, the way that they're using the retail space has, is not at the full capacity that it used to be. The mall, when it was full, um, as I said, was 93,000 square feet. Now it is sitting 70% vacant. This is 65,000 square feet vacant on our main street in the core of our downtown. The city hired a consultant to help us look at options of what we could do with this. They came back with three different options ranging from partial demolition to full demolition, but every option that they shared with the city included the reopening of Main Street. We used this information to look for a developer who would be interested in coming into Lesur and doing some redevelopment. Um, we did find a developer from the Mankato area, Building Good Downtowns LLC. They saw the potential redevelopment of this site and agreed to move forward with us. This was crucial for us because what the city was doing by asking this redeveloper to come into town, we were also asking them to help us reopen Main Street. And to do that, they had to demolish 18,000 square feet from a building that they were in the process of acquiring. That's huge to ask them from the instant they get a building to take off 18,000 square feet of it. Um, we were able to offer this developer a TIF, a redevelopment TIF, but this only generated $450,000. What happens is because we were doing a redevelopment, we weren't really building on, we were actually taking off square footage. Luckily, there is a second story to the mall. The developer is gonna turn that into apartments. So therefore we qualified for a redevelopment TIF. As I said, with the $450,000 generated though, the developer asked for 100% of this TIF. They needed it to move tenants, to do a new build out, to bring them all up to today's standards. This was a 40 plus year old building. Um, their costs are looking at over $4 million. 
So this left the city with a gap of our own because we needed funds to finance the demolition of that 18,000 square feet. We had to move utilities and we had to construct a new main street. We have about a $2 million gap. The city applied for deeds redevelopment funding. Unfortunately, we were not able to get it the first year we applied because they did not have enough funds. We reapplied a second year and thankfully we were awarded $857,000. This is huge for our city because um, we will still have to bond for about $1.2 million, but our city only has a population of 4,000 people. We are a very small community, and this is huge for us. You know, one thing that we were worried about is if we didn't get this funding and the developer walked away, what would happen to our city? When people saw this vacancy in our core downtown, they assumed our city was dying, and they were basically right. We were dying. Our population has been stagnant for years. Our school district has declining enrollment. We have some issues, but I've had people say, the first thing I notice when I get into your town is it looks like your town is dying. This You have this huge vacant building right in the middle of town. So this was just crucial for us to get these funds from DEED. Because of these funds, we are now able to retain 22 jobs. These jobs and these businesses are crucial for the city of Lesseur. I'm talking about a dentist's office, an orthodontics office, there's an optometrist office, a pharmacy, a hardware store. These are, these are for small town America, these are important, important businesses. And we now have potential to add new businesses in the redevelopment area. Plus the developer is gonna put those 17 apartments on the second story, which is gonna add housing. We are also having housing challenges much like many other cities. Um, this has been a very complicated project, but I have to tell you how much the city of Lesseur truly appreciates the state of Minnesota's investment in the redevelopment grant program. Um, I appreciate Deed and their staff, and just, this has been a huge success for our city. Um, this is, I tell everyone, this is a game changer for Lesseur, and it truly is. And I would love for you to come to Lesseur anytime you want. I'd love to give you a tour. I think you'll talk to our residents and see that this has really reinvigorated our community. Um, lastly, I not only work for the city of Lesseur, but I also proudly serve as the vice president of the Economic Development Association of Minnesota, of EDEM. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with EDEM, but we are a statewide economic development organization. The Minnesota Investment Fund, the Job Creation Fund, and the Redevelopment Fund are programs that are vital to our communities. And the, the members that we have, they are in every corner of the state of Minnesota. So these programs are vital for our members, for our communities we serve. And we just truly appreciate you listening to this bill and we fully support funding of uh, House File 819. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. The next person is Mr. Hickok. Thank you, Chair Noor, members of the committee. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. My name is Scott Hickok. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Fridley. And today I'll talk to you about two projects that we had in Fridley, both of them um, very, very successful, uh, and both of them had to do with funding uh, through DEED. Uh, part of this was uh, through the redevelopment grant funds. The other part uh, was through MIF. And I'll spend a little bit of time today uh, very briefly to tell you about each one of these. Uh, next slide, please. With the use of re uh, DEED redevelopment grant funds, we were able to uh, inspire a development on 122 acres. This 122 acres was a development that uh, used to be the home of Northern Pump, later FMC and BAE, British Aerospace Electronics, uh, was the final uh, user of that site. Uh, BAE Mr. Was Mr. Hancock, I just, I didn't want to interrupt you, but the slides are not moving, so they're just static in the first page. So if you wanted to, uh, you need to put it in a presentation mode and then go to the next. Yep, that's good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate your pointing that out. Um, through the use of funds, uh, we were able to, if I could back up to the last slide, please. Um, through the use of these funds, we were able to not only inspire development on this site. This is a 122-acre site that developers for many, many years went by the site. Uh, BAE was still in there though they were only using a small portion of the 2 million square feet. To put it in perspective, 2 million square feet is what the IDS tower is. This was an industrial site though spread across the land. Very little of that square foot dimension was actually being put to use. Uh, and a major portion of that building really re needed redevelopment. Developers would tell us that this site was too expensive even if they got the land for free. They could not afford the demolition of the 
buildings and some of the infrastructure improvements that they would need to make this site work. Through the use of redevelopment grant funds, we were able to help a developer inspire that developer to redevelop the site. They used deed funds in the amount of $500,000 for the demolition of pavement on the site, for water and sanitary sewer connections, for new water main installation, and for a relocation of an existing sanitary sewer on site. Very important pieces to the development. What did that bring then? Next slide, please, Charlie. The Northern Stacks development, as it then built out, brought us, replaced the 2 million square feet of outdated inefficient building with 1.6 million square feet of new and improved office, showroom, and industrial space. There were less than 400 jobs left uh, on the BAE site when the developer took over this site and was inspired by these funds. Now there are over 2,000 jobs on that site, 1,600 jobs improvement. The site was valued at $13 million back when it was undeveloped or developed with this very underdeveloped state, a very large building without a lot of future potential. Uh, the site is now $113 million, an increase of $100 million in value, uh, which is incredible. Uh, and, and that's to the tax base ultimately. And eventually heavy contamination was able to be cleaned up on this site because of these dollars that really inspired the growth. Charlie, next slide. To be able to see this graphically, um, you can see on the left side of your screen, that very large industrial complex that at one time really served a wonderful purpose in providing munitions and military armaments. But um, as it aged and as the use became less and less and it became just more research and engineering in the building, manufacturing had left, it was a cavernous space that needed a new life. On the right side of your screen, you will see the 1.6 million square feet of new industrial. What's beautiful about this is that it's a really diverse industrial population in there. And by being a diverse industrial population, it really helps to weather uh, economic storms and it really provides us an opportunity to have a great mix of industry, new jobs, new excitement for the area. Next slide, Charlie. You'll see a before and after here. Uh, you can see on the left side of your screen what it looked like when, in, when developers said, we couldn't afford it if you gave it to us for free. We can't afford to tear it down, much less put any improvements on the land. On the right side of your screen, you'll see the uh, a glimpse of the end product that Hyde Development brought to this site, Paul Hyde and others. Uh, really a beautiful end representation of what can happen with the uh, inspiration of these funds and bringing about new and exciting architecture to the land. I always like to say that development begets development. And sometimes it just takes that inspiration to get the first spoon of earth dug out and, and, and much great things to follow. I'll move on to uh, myth. Once this was developed, once we had 1.6 million square feet of new industrial space, there uh, was another inspiration that happened through the Minnesota Investment Fund. And there was a group called Certified Power Incorporated and they were looking at taking um, a, a space in this site. What they were looking at doing is they had three locations. They had one in Illinois and they had two in Minnesota. It was uh, becoming very inefficient for them to work in that manner. They really needed to uh, combine their site. They needed to come to one location and it was either going to be Minnesota or Illinois. Through the Minnesota Investment Fund, they chose Fridley in a large part because they were inspired by the funds that they could gain by, by bringing, uh, making their capital investments here and by bringing new jobs to this region. Next slide. We're very, very pleased that they came to Fridley. We're very, very pleased that they have added to, um, not only to our tax base here, but they have brought jobs and excitement to our community. And next slide, Charlie. What they brought is the addition um, over the next two years, hopefully 36 new full-time equivalent um, jobs within uh, four years. Um, uh, with, within the first two years, 10 of those jobs within four years, 36 jobs. Also, they have brought $2.25 million in capital investment 
Um, add that on top of the $113 million of value that Hyde Development brought by bringing the shells of the buildings. You have places like Certified Power Inc. then that brought an additional $2.25 million to our tax base and to provide jobs, uh, the jobs, um, again, 36 jobs within the next four years, we're very excited about. And my last slide, Charlie. We are thrilled in Fridley to have Certified Power Inc. And we want to thank the state of Minnesota indeed for the inspiration that first brought the life back to 122 acres uh, through the redevelopment dollars. And then second, through the Minnesota Investment Fund, we were able to attract a business like Certified Power Inc. who plans to spend a lot of years here in the future. And we're just very, very happy to have them. With that, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. The next person last uh, uh, testifies, Mr. Brisson. Please uh, uh, welcome and introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Nora. My name is Jason Brisson. I'm the Assistant City Administrator and Director of Economic Development for the City of Worthington, Minnesota. I uh, just want to say thank you to Representative Nora and the Workforce and Business Development uh, Committee for hearing this bill today. Uh, thanks to Representative Cagle for her introduction and authorship of the bill. Uh, thanks to Representative Hamilton for always looking out for our interests in St. Paul there. Um, and I also want to just say thanks to Bob Isaacson and his team at DEED for their assistance with this project, especially uh, Lisa Hughes, Jason Burek, and Tom Washa uh, were really the folks that helped us out. Um, so I'll admit I'm from St. Paul. Um, so if you're like me and didn't know where Worthington was, we're located in the bottom left-hand corner of Minnesota is the best way to describe it. Um, it makes our job a little bit challenging because we compete with South Dakota and Iowa for jobs and sometimes they're willing to give away the farm. Uh, so DEED hopefully helps us level the playing field in some instances. Um, as you may know, most rural communities in the state of Minnesota are in population decline, they're aging, they're relatively homogeneous, um, and they're seeing disinvestment. I think there was a little bit of talk about that today. Uh, on the flip side, Worthington is actually booming. We've shown double digit census growth over the past two census periods. Uh, we're getting younger. We're the third most diverse city in the state per capita. And uh, we also have the second largest share of residents who don't speak English at home, although 42% of them speak good English. So we are a very unusual rural community. Um, and you know, we also have seen a lot of investment. We had 72 million in construction for 2020, um, which doesn't include some major capital investments. And that was more than double than we had ever done before. So we're pretty proud of that number. Um, and so I guess the question is what are what is driving uh, these trends? And the answer to that would be mostly the Swift Port Company uh, who we partnered with uh, and Deed. So they have employed 2,200 people. Well, now with this project is 2,300. I still have to get used to saying that number now because it's been 22 for so long. Um, they process 20,000 hogs per day. Uh, they're part of JBS, who is uh, the largest animal protein processor in the world, and they are the world's second largest pork producer. So fun little fact, if you buy pork at Costco, anyone on the Zoom call today, it came from Worthington. And if you buy uh, pork from Costco anywhere in the world, it came from JBS. So that's kind of an interesting little little fact. Um, so they're a huge part of the economic uh, ecosystem for Southwest Minnesota, the trucking companies, the farms, the grocery stores that uh, all the people they employ buy, all the different stores. So they're a huge part of our ecosystem. And they've been trying to get this expansion project done for about 10 years long before I ever got here. Um, and it took a little bit of salesmanship on the behalf of our local uh, folks here at the plant and deeds help. So they have 300 facilities worldwide. Uh, and we were really in the running with their facility in Illinois, not different from the last uh, testimony we just heard. Uh, so deeds stepped up to the table and offered 450,000 in Minnesota investment funds and $550,000 in job creation funds. Um, and if you're not exactly familiar with how these work, um, what happens is MIF grants uh, dollars to the city and then the city loans those out to the employer. Um, and the job creation fund is a performance-based assistance where as they continue to meet the job and the wage goals, Deed will pay uh, the, uh, the employer back. So 
uh, with our labor quality and deed uh, sweetening the pot, we were able to get the deal done. Uh, we leveraged $29 million of private investment uh, with a million dollars in public investment. Those of you who have been doing economic development for a while know that's a pretty good return on investment. Um, it's a $30 million project. 175,000 square foot facility, uh, approximately 70 new full-time jobs ranging from 17 an hour to 21 an hour plus benefits. Um, and if you want me to uh, kind of show you the scale and, and scope of this, they're capable of holding 25 million pounds of frozen product and two and a half million pounds of fresh product. I can't even really wrap my brain around that scale, but uh, that just gives you a sense of the, the, uh, the how they uh, operate. Um, so I guess uh, what the takeaway point is, this has been a huge success story for Worthington. Um, I hope that these tools continue to be available for other communities so they can grow and thrive like Worthington. And I think you all are holding the purse strings. So I hope uh, you hear that uh, coming from my testimony today. And I'd just like to say thank you to Deed and thank you for uh, the committee for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Um, uh, members, any discussion? I know Lead Hamilton will be Happy to know that uh, his district was mentioned in the conversation as, as how these programs work. Any questions? I don't see any questions. Uh, Lynn Hamilton, did you want to make a statement? Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for just pointing that out. Uh, we're very proud down there, the city of Worthington, and, and nice job on your testimony as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, as the uh, process we move on with bills I think something that uh, we have mentioned from the beginning we look into the equity and how we spend some some of the resources um, with closing remarks uh, represent Kegel as you renew your motion uh, can you tell us a little bit about how we will be able to put some equity into this program I know we do have a small portion of it in the bill uh, I'm also looking for the long term not just the brief assessment that we're doing in the bill today Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so um, some of the equity language I worked on with um, Deed, and really this is just about outreach and technical assistance. I think, you know, um, a lot of folks don't know that these programs are available. And then um, the application process tends to be kind of um, cumbersome. And so we wanted to make sure that we were making um, community aware of these programs, that this funding is available for them. And then if they needed any help um, applying, that deed was there to offer them assistance. And so we applied that um, equity language to both the MIF and the um, Job Creation Fund. Um, and I also just um, wanted to mention that uh, my dad and my aunt both worked at BAE Systems. And so um, I actually was able to get security clearance for a day and did the um, bring your daughter to work day. And um, that site is huge. People had bikes and golf carts to get around in. And so um, it's really neat to see how that, um, how that facility has changed. And so, and I also think that Mr. Brissom um, highlighted some of the need for the equity um, language as well, because we want to make sure that folks um, from all different parts, uh, you know, from all different parts of the state and all different walks of life are able to access this and really start to, you know, build generational wealth. And so that's really kind of where some of that equity language came in. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Kegel. Uh, renews her motion, House File 819, be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, with that, members, we're moving to House File 600 with Majority Leader Winkler. Uh, welcome to the committee. Um, I just wanted to remind folks that uh, we do have more than 15 individuals who sign up to testify. In case we don't get to you, because this bill has traveled throughout uh, uh, the House, so it's going to go to a next level. And I want to make sure that people just take two minutes. Uh, if you take more than that, I may cut you off. I don't want to be rude, but I just wanted to remind everyone, please keep your comments and testimony um, brief. With that, I wanted to move House File 600 to be re referred to Agriculture, Finance, and Policy. Uh, welcome, uh, Lida Winkler. Uh, did you want to move the, the um, amendment that you have? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if you would be willing to uh, put that um, uh, amendment or move the amendment and we can uh, put the bill in the shape I'd like to present it. I'd appreciate it. Uh, members, I move uh, A11. I believe that's the amendment that we have. Um, any discussions? See none. Uh, all those in favor of uh, approving A11, please say aye. 
Aye. Opposed? Aye. The motion prevails. Uh, the uh, amendment is now adopted. Leader Winkler, to your bill, House File 600 as amended. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, we are trying to do our best to confine discussion of this bill with its many public policy implica implications to the committee jurisdiction uh, at hand uh, on any one day. Uh, we, Minnesota has a thriving cannabis marketplace today. Uh, depending on which statistics you look at, uh, anywhere from 600 to 700,000 Minnesotans consume cannabis every year. Uh, acquisition of cannabis products is contrary to law, so we have a very thriving, uh, unregulated, illicit marketplace. The goal of this bill, among other things, is to shift an illegal marketplace into a safe and legal regulated marketplace for people to uh, purchase and be able to consume cannabis products. Uh, in doing this, uh, and we can discuss the, the broader issues related to legalization, the inequity uh, built into our criminal justice system, the ways in which uh, African Americans in particular are uh, targeted for uh, unfair levels of policing, uh, and we can talk about uh, the health benefits uh, and all the other reasons uh, that legalization is on the agenda. But from an economic development standpoint, we have a marketplace. We are trying to shift that marketplace into uh, a legal regulated uh, marketplace. And in doing so, we have an opportunity to build a legal marketplace from the ground up according to uh, policies that reflect the values of Minnesotans. And so when I did my 15 stop Be Heard on Cannabis tour, uh, we heard overwhelmingly that Minnesotans want this to be a craft type industry. They want this to be an industry that permits uh, small and micro businesses to thrive. Uh, we heard overwhelmingly that people want this industry to uh, create opportunity for communities and individuals who've been harmed by our war on drugs, uh, which has been dis uh, discriminately applied, to have an opportunity to participate in the upside. Uh, and that means that we don't want to create an industry that is dominated by just a few uh, big players uh, with uh, national corporate money behind it, but rather to build a Minnesota-based industry that will serve the needs of Minnesotans and provide for uh, some level of equity. So the provisions of the bill that are in front of you today relate to um, grant programs to allow people to uh, be trained, to navigate, and to get startup capital for getting involved in this industry. And for just a little bit more context, uh, we are working uh, in uh, provisions of this bill to limit licensure to prevent uh, vertical integration so that you can't grow, manufacture, distribute, and, and sell in retail locations with one license. Uh, and no entity can integrate fully unless you are a very small business. A micro business can fully vertically integrate. That means that there are a lot of different types of business opportunities and job opportunities uh, in this marketplace as we develop it. So in order to make sure that people who um, are learning about this marketplace for the first time can get access to uh, basic training, get access to navigating how the system works, and get access to startup funding, we are including upfront appropriations in this bill to allow that to happen. Eventually, as the industry grows and develops and matures, the revenue collected from it will fund the uh, type of equity grants that are included in this bill. But we're starting with an appropriation on the front end, knowing that as we develop the industry from the beginning, we want to make sure that these goals that we've heard from Minnesotans are actually being incorporated from the beginning. So that's why the bill is in front of you today. Uh, that's why it's in this committee. Uh, there are a number of testifiers, and um, I think hearing from them is uh, most important, and I'm happy then to take questions uh, after uh, those testifiers have uh, proceeded. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Majority Leader Winkler, for uh, bringing this bill forward. And we do have uh, many individuals who signed up to testify, as the Majority Leader indicated. Uh, the jurisdiction for this committee is on the Business and Workforce Development under Article 4. Uh, please uh, keep your remarks uh, to that section. Uh, with the first testifier, I just wanted to welcome 
a longtime friend, uh, Mr. Bill English. Uh, welcome to the committee and uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to testify before this group today. My name is Bill English. I reside at 12850th Avenue North in Plymouth, Minnesota. I have I spent 32 years at Control Data 17 as a vice president, in which I was involved in job creation, including creating jobs in North Minneapolis, a factor that lasted over 22 years and had over 200 jobs. I did the same thing in Washington, D.C., in San Antonio, Texas, Oklahoma City, and even a rural community, all white, that was called Campton, Kentucky. So I brought this experience when I retired from the Total Data in 2000 to the North Job Creation Team, which is dedicated to bringing 1,000 living wage jobs and benefits to North Minneapolis. We've been extraordinarily successful with that in getting that done. I want to address the subject at hand. I don't need to remind this committee the number of African Americans that have been impacted by the war on drugs, and particularly the, the sale of small amounts of uh, cannabis. But the impact that that has had on jobs in, is twofold. Number one, many of our husbands and two working families, the men were locked up because low wage jobs, and they be selling small bags of marijuana in order to survive. So it had a serious impact on that. This bill will create, create an opportunity with equity to, to boost the economy and allow our people to get involved in an industry that has shown nothing but growth and create living wage jobs and benefits for a community that suffers the highest disparity in the country. I need not remind this committee that the New York Times pointed out that Minneapolis and Minnesota has the highest disparities in all levels, including workforce, pay, childhood deaths, and everything else, all these disparities. So this bill goes a long way of creating a vibrant economic opportunity for communities like North Minneapolis, as well as other communities across the state where people of color in general and African Americans, American descendants of slaves in particular. This bill will give us a unique opportunity. So I want to thank you that I'd like to proceed this bill and allow cannabis to stir up and improve the, the economics in our communities because it is badly needed. And we deserve an opportunity given our overrepresentation in people who served many years in prison for selling small amounts of marijuana. Thank you for this opportunity and I'll answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. English. The next person is Dabney, the third. Welcome to the committee and please uh, introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you for uh, the time. I'm Clement Dabney. I'm a a uh, PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. I study uh, cannabis terpene production, or the genetics of terpene production in cannabis. I have a master's in plant breeding and molecular genetics that I got from the University of Minnesota. Uh, for the past three years, I've been leasing land from farmers in Minnesota uh, for my businesses, Empire Genetics and Empire Farms. Uh, this has been a mutual relationship because as a black Minnesotan, I do not own tillable land or have expensive farm implements or buildings for ag production. So the farmers we work with benefit from uh, lease payments for land, barn space for drying and equipment rentals. And uh, cannabis has been bringing in the hemp industry, rural communities, much needed economic support. Uh, though there is a hemp industry in Minnesota, the entire US hemp industry is about $1 billion. Uh, and thus there's limited opportunities. If we compare Minnesota to Colorado, a very similar state in terms of population and economic demographics, in 2020 alone, they sold uh, $2 billion worth of adult use cannabis. Uh, so Minnesota has kind of, the pro prohibition of cannabis in Minnesota has limited our economic potential. Uh, the University of Minnesota, uh, where I am getting educated for a PhD, uh, teaches an undergraduate course, Agro 2402, Cannabis Science, uh, which I've been a guest lecturer every year they've taught it. Uh, and the U University of Minnesota trains graduate students such as myself in cannabis genetics 
uh, but there's limited opportunities, economic opportunities uh, inside Minnesota uh, to uh, be employed by that industry. Um, so often I do consulting work uh, for states in California, Michigan, Oklahoma, and when I travel there, I'm injecting my money to support their hospitality, lodging, transportation, and food industries, and that money is lost in Minnesota. And I see that if cannabis prohibition does not come to an end soon, those getting educated at the university will leave the state to seek employment opportunities, and this could result in a brain drain in our state as economic educated professionals leave the state to seek employment in other states' cannabis industries. And uh, thank, I, thank, I thank, uh, you thank, thank you so much, Mr. W. The next person I have is Strong. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Bonjour, this is uh, Sam Strong. I'm uh, Secretary of the Red Lake Nation. Um, you know, I just want to speak real briefly on some of the uh, dire economic situations here on the reservation. Um, you know, we're looking at a, a crisis national of unemployment rates, and we've been, you know, above 40% unemployment for as long as I've worked here the past 15 years. And, and the reality is we have very limited access to uh, employment opportunities as well as uh, business opportunities that uh, could provide livable wages for our people. Um, we've also been uh, very disproportionately affected by uh, the war on drugs, and hence our workforce has been impacted by uh, the, the criminality that this war on drugs has brought to our workforce. And so twofold, you know, working with uh, really improving those disparities, but more importantly, creating an economy here uh, is incredibly important for uh, people that 70% uh, of our people are living below the poverty line. And, um, you know, as many of the other testifiers have talked about, you know, this industry is immense. You know, we're talking about $2 billion. And the reality is many of our people uh, have been impacted and we intend on creating uh, livable wage jobs and uh, bringing money onto the reservation to, you know, solve these uh, really decades, if not centuries of uh, oppression that has really uh, harmed our people and brought, brought about uh, many um, social issues in our community. And so, you know, for us, it's really important that um, we uh, move forward with this and, and legitimate, uh, create a legitimate industry in a place that uh, has been you know, illegal for, for many years and has impacted our people. And uh, it's happening here. So why not regulate it, make it safer and <clears throat> you know, create more jobs for people that are in dire need of employment? Uh, that's all Thank I you. have to share. I think and, and members and guests uh, and the members of the public, please uh, mute your mics as we uh, listen to the testifiers. The next person that I have is Elaine Rasmussen. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, Chairman uh, Noor, thank you for this opportunity to testify and thank you for everybody and all the other preceding comments. My name is Elaine Rasmussen. I'm a St. Paul resident and founder of CEO and CEO of Social Impact Strategies Group located in St. Paul. We, are per, we provide consulting on inclusive economic development, social impact and racial equity design. I'm here to share my brief comments. Some I will echo of Leader uh, Winkler and some of my other comments, but I wanna get very specific on some of the, the, the language that I think needs to be uh, addressed. Um, according to the ACLU, half of all marijuana related arrests are for individuals and not drug cartel distributors. In Minnesota, it was found that blacks were seven to eight times more likely to be um, arrested, coming only in third to DC and Iowa. This disproportionate law enforcement comes at a price of job loss, and increased reliance on public assistance program. As of 2018, Minnesota arrests for blacks was 536 for every 100,000 people versus 100 whites who are arrested for every 100,000 people. We were, were ranked eighth worst state in the nation. Um, it is estimated that states are currently spending $3.5 billion on marijuana enforcement. And as city councils uh, wrestle with budget appropriations and realignment of police fundings, these, funding, these funds could be redirected to COVID and other re relevant opportunities to rebuild the economy, such as uh, increase of wage for teachers and entrepreneur ecosystem infrastructure for this bill. Um, 
we really quickly, we know the war on drugs intentionally and maliciously was a form of institutional racism that affected blacks and people of color. John Ehrlichman, counsel to Nixon, basically said, uh, quote, we know we couldn't make it illegal to be against blacks, but getting getting the public to, to associate hippies and marijuana with blacks and heroin, then criminalizing them both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. I understand some of the concerns such as Majority Leader Gazelka, who's, who's concerned about public safety. Um, but this is really about, while we've seen some, some, some situations in particular states, um, they're, they're actually arrests across the nation for marijuana use has gone down. Some of my specific things that I really want you all to consider as we think about um, the undoing the harms of incarceration, uh, criminal convictions, job loss, housing, financial aid, child custody, immigration status, there are some specific things that I would encourage you to tighten up the language in the legislation. There needs to be an explicit prioritization of technical assistance and capital for communities most impacted by marijuana related incarceration as we as they transition to to enter the legal market there needs to be forgivable and low interest loans for licensure certification and business development there needs to be appropriations for real estate acquisition including farmland and brick and mortar spaces there also needs to be earmarks for small farmers. Not everybody is going to be having acres, as, as my colleague, um, Mr. Dabney, uh, said, that there, there are going to be small farmers. And I didn't see any explicit language that Ms. addresses. Ms. Rasmussen, Rus Rus please uh, wrap the uh, testimony so we can go to the next person. Absolutely. And ensure that there is an on-ramp. Um, that's the biggest thing is that if you are, when prioritizing people of color and blacks in particular around this bill, that there needs to be time so that the, they get the education and the training and the infrastructure that they need to be actually do well in the marketplace. Thank you for your time and consideration. And happy uh, to thank, be uh, Thank you. The next person is Steve Kalina. Please uh, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Steve Kalina. I'm the president and CEO of the Minnesota Precision Manufacturing Association. Some manufacturers do see positives with House File 600, such as decriminalization and more access for medicinal purposes. However, there are three concerns I'll discuss. The most important being safety. Manufacturers employ highly skilled individuals that run million dollar machines making devices that save lives or keep a plane in the sky. One wrong move could cause a $50,000 repair. One bad product could crash a plane or kill a patient. Allowing recreational marijuana risks workers' safety, millions of dollars in capital, and most importantly, the quality of products that could cost lives. Would you want someone under the influence producing the life-saving device that goes into your child or assembling the brake lines in your car? The bill identifies jobs such as police, doctors, and educators where marijuana is still restricted. The authors understand impaired people have limited capacity for key jobs, but now we'll put that burden on employers. One company policy will not suffice with a range of entry level to key roles. The second concern is testing. The bill's authors have said there's no correlation between the amount of THC in someone's system and their level of impairment. Their solution is training for police. That helps, but as a military policeman, I can tell you that training for detection is not an objective measurement. Now place that burden on thousands of businesses. 80% of Minnesota manufacturers have 50 employees or less. They do not have trained experts to detect impairment, let alone on a substance that is almost impossible to quantify or prove. Yes, the bill does say that employers have the ability to limit and hold employees accountable for impairment, but if we cannot measure impairment, then that is a moot point. I hope you will demand further testing capabilities or leave our employers to fend for themselves when it comes to safety of employees or potential litigation over product quality or employment lawsuits. Who will be accountable? And lastly, jobs. An argument that this will generate is that this will generate more revenue and jobs. Minnesota does not need more jobs. We need an efficient allocation of trained people where they are needed. Like many industries, manufacturing is short tens of thousands of workers and it's getting worse. We have precision machining jobs paying 70 to $80,000 and we have lots of those jobs available today. Investing in entry level jobs such as cannabis trimming is not going to address racial disparities <laughs> when we already have vacancies in solid career paths. In fact, this bill proposes taking a half million dollars of, of state training grants away from high paying industries short on labor. But in the Thank end, you. assuming this, uh, just a few more seconds, Chair, Mr. Chair. Uh, but in the end, assuming this or a similar bill will eventually move forward, we simply ask that it provides a better understanding of testing and impairment 
and support and guidance for employers. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kalaina. So the next person is Laura Ginsberg. Welcome to the committee uh, and proceed. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Laura Mann Ginsberg and I'm a partner and principal at Blunt Strategies, Minnesota's first and largest public affairs firm dedicated to the legal cannabis industry. And I would argue that we do need more jobs in this space. I'm speaking to you today in support of House File 600. We are a women-owned public benefit corporation supporting a range of Minnesota businesses and organizations working to build a safe and equitable legal cannabis industry here in Minnesota. To build connections in this space, especially among women who routinely find themselves underrepresented in areas of business leadership, Blunt Strategies launched the Minnesota Women's Cannabis Business Association early last year because there are a lot of people interested in finding new careers in this space. With over 100 members and growing, the network includes women working in or interested in working in all parts of the legal cannabis industry. As you consider the bill before you to expand Minnesota's cannabis industry with an emphasis on social equity, I ask you to please recognize it as an opportunity we cannot let pass by. Women accounted for 100% of jobs lost in December in the United States, and we are now looking at a workforce disparity between men and women that resembles 1988. When we think about economic recovery and the long-term health and prosperity of our state's economy, we need to consider the ways new areas of business can contribute to strengthening our workforce. Data collected in 2019 from across states with legal cannabis shows that there are more women executives in the cannabis industry than any other sector of the economy. In fact, women account for nearly 40% of executive positions in cannabis. What we've also seen, however, is that states that haven't prioritized a local craft business industry or provided support programs with startup funding, workforce training, and technical assistance have seen significantly fewer women and BIPOC-owned businesses thrive. House File 600 seeks to create new pathways to helping individuals from BIPOC, marginalized, underrepresented, and disproportionately affected communities find footing and success. As a lifelong Minnesotan and an entrepreneur who works every day with local businesses and leaders who are finding new ways to contribute to our state's job market and economy, I know that we can responsibly legalize and regulate cannabis while doing the most good for Minnesota's workforce, communities, and residents. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. The next person is uh, Bemis. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. The next person in line is uh, Dr. Kasman. So please welcome to the committee and uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. My name is Carter Kasmer. I'm an emergency physician. I've worked clinically in the Twin Cities largest referral centers and trauma centers over the last nine years. And I'm an expert in diagnosing and treating life-threatening conditions and medical emergencies. To be clear, cannabis does not precipitate either. I hope to clarify today whether from a medical perspective, there is sufficient danger posed by the recreational use of cannabis to justify any response on the part of our law enforcement organizations. The simple answer is no, but comprehending that answer is complex considering our policy towards cannabis is one that since its inception has been informed by alarmism, ignorance of the physiology of cannabinoids and disregard for the lived experiences of a majority of law abiding citizens who have either previously used or currently used cannabis. The quickest path to the truth lies with simply listening to your patient. In doing so, one quickly realizes our patients know what all physicians know deep down, that our government dishonestly classifies cannabis as addictive, equally dangerous as heroin, and more dangerous than cocaine, methamphetamine, and prescription opiates and sedatives. They know its responsible use doesn't deserve a fine, a court date, jail time, or a criminal record. They know cannabis used responsibly is a mild intoxicant with no dose capable of causing death or disability. They know that as with alcohol, tobacco, prescription, and over-the-counter medications, high-calorie foods, and social media, there exists the potential for abuse, but with education and moderation, this risk can be easily mitigated. They know we need supportive physicians who embrace education and harm reduction to help those with certain medical and psychiatric conditions make healthy decisions. We don't need this important conversation to be diluted by the anxieties of law enforcement personnel. I'm sure they would agree that their talents are better spent preventing and solving serious crimes than advising the public on the finer points of medical toxicology. We have before us a historic opportunity to once and for all build an informed, reasonable, and compassionate cannabis policy in our state. For a minority of you, this may seem to be a tough decision, but let me assure you it's the obvious one. Please vote to legalize cannabis in the state of Minnesota. Thank you so much. The next question is Gallagher. 
Please welcome to the committee, introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, I think th that's me, Tom Gallagher. Mr. Chair, thank sorry, you. Sorry, that's correct. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Gallagher. Okay, actually you have the correct Irish pronunciation, so I credit you for that. I, I go with the American incorrect pronunciation normally, so thank you. Um, I'm a criminal defense attorney in Minneapolis. My firm is Gallagher Criminal Defense. I'm associated with Minnesota Normal and Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition. I've been asked to briefly uh, comment on the issue of marijuana DUI. And I have, I believe my article has been submitted into the record on that. But I'll just hit a couple high points, uh, spotlight a couple think, bullet points on that. One is that, um, the argument that we shouldn't legalize because there will be an increased risk of DUI marijuana is largely based on a false premise that uh, nobody uses marijuana now, and if it's legalized, suddenly a lot of people will be using it. Obviously, that's false uh, because many people already use marijuana, and uh, most people who try marijuana, uh, in fact, 80% or more of the people have tried it, and only about 15% are regular users. So most people don't like it, don't continue to use it. Unlike alcohol, most people who've tried alcohol become regular users defined as one use or more in the past 30 days. Um, is marijuana DUI a real problem? Uh, maybe not. Uh, and I cite to the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, which is a federal agency that deals with uh, law enforcement issues and DUI enforcement and training law enforcement to deal with DUI. They have done a lot of really good work uh, funding scientific studies as well as law enforcement uh, efforts where they pay law police to do saturation patrols like 4th of July weekend, things like that. Um, they, they have done many uh, studies and summaries of studies about the science of DUI marijuana. And um, for example, they have pointed out that with alcohol, blood alcohol concentration levels of 0.05 to 0.08, the risk of a motor vehicle crash increases 600%. Um, drivers with two or more passengers, there's a 220% increase in crash risk. Driving while pregnant, 42% increase in crash risk. Acute cannabis intoxication, means, meaning very intoxicated on cannabis, up to a 40% increase, uh, which is similar basically the same as the increased risk of talking with a hands-free cell phone, which is currently legal in Minnesota. So apparently the risk of driving uh, with a hands-free cell phone is an acceptable risk in Minnesota, even though it's an increased risk of, risk of crash. And that is the same risk that uh, highly intoxicated people on cannabis present. So it Mr. really- Young. Yes. If you can uh, wrap your testimony that, uh, so that we can go to the next question, please. Okay. Well, I will wrap it there and just uh, offer to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much. The next person is uh, Mead. Please uh, uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, the next person in line is uh, Henderson. Uh, Mr. Chair. Who's, Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't unmuted, but I, I'm unmuted now. Uh, please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Awesome. Hello, I'm Candace Mead. Um, I, live, I live in Duluth, Minnesota. I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me to speak on this important matter today. Um, I'm a mom of four, and I'm a general manager of three local retail shops up north, our main being Saudi Smoke Shop here in um, Duluth, Minnesota. I have played a big role in pushing CBD products to, uh, in our shops because um, I understand the benefits. Since introducing CBD into our stores, our sales have grown exponentially the past two years, allowing us to open two more shops in Cloquet, Minnesota and Hibbing, Minnesota, and soon another new location. Cannabis has always been normalized in my Republican dynamic family as alcohol has been in many other families. I have firsthand witness to helping many um, I have firsthand witness for it helping um, many of my families cope with both physical and mental um, issues, achieving a better life for them. Our business has reached 30 to 40,000 customers a weekly, on a weekly basis, helping 
people with issues such as arthritis, chronic pain, insomnia, depression, anxiety, and a handful of other medical complications. I have heard numerous stories of CBD helping our community members and otherwise um, who would otherwise stay away from pharmaceutical options um, and see it, see the change that's happening in the adult cannabis community. With um, our CBD sales alone, we have been able to support our families better and give our employees more livable wages. This has helped our business in numerous ways and I can only imagine what it could do for other businesses in Minnesota. Legalizing cannabis would help incarcerated people get better opportunities and integrate them back in the community, giving people an opportunity to do what they already love creates trust and honesty already between the employee and the employer, allowing incarcerated people a sense of pride um, in what they are capable of and giving them a chance to start above minimum wage. More revenue for Duluth to fix our streets and help with education. Duluth is one of, a, one of the largest cities with the largest tourist attractions and many trails for maintenance. Um, this would also stimulate more growth in our workforce as far as growing, processing, distribution, and dispensaries and also um, more ind indirect things like research centers, construction companies, and law firms. Um, I'd just like to thank the committee for letting me speak on such an important matter close to my heart. Uh, I hope that we finally push beyond the reefer madness era and understand the true wellness and benefits of cannabis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Henderson. Please welcome to the committee and introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. I'm Cameron Henderson, I'm CFO. Uh, IT administrator, event manager, janitor at uh, Stigma Hump. Uh, I think those of you who are part of a small business so know how that goes. Uh, in 2017, our family was forced to research uh, alternative solutions to fighting stage four cancer and cannabis quickly rose to the top of that list. After a negative, negative experience with Minnesota Medical Program, family members chose to do what many other families have had to do and take the risk of traveling to a Western state to find the proper cannabis product at a reasonable cost and it wasn't available in Minnesota. This experience coupled with educating ourselves on the history and science of cannabis fueled the motivation to launch a cannabis company. With the legalization of hemp in 2018, we decided to mortgage our houses and launch a retail company in the CBD industry. We branded ourselves Stigma after learning how little our friends, relatives, and acquaintances knew about cannabis and with a desire to normalize cannabis as an option to explore helping any number of ailments. In 2019, we opened up our retail showroom in downtown Minneapolis so we could personally help educate the community and be, begin building our knowledge and capabilities to help lead and support a local sustainable economy. At the same time, we helped launch the Minnesota Hemp Association, where we saw a high level of interest from hundreds of Minnesota farmers and small businesses. Many of these small businesses are ready to make the transition into cannabis after already investing into their own infrastructure. Being a local leader in the CBD space, we are preparing to also lead in a future legal cannabis industry. As we scale up our leadership team and workforce, we are prioritizing people of color and strongly believe in helping to right the wrongs that occurred over the last few decades with the war on drugs and its disproportionate impact on communities of color. We are also engaged with the state and our partner head business, businesses to provide a job training framework to help support a reentry program for future cannabis expungements so there's a program ready to go in day one. With federal and corporate cannabis making significant progress every year, similar to the Walmart and Amazon effect, we believe the longer we wait to legalize in Minnesota, the harder it will be for local businesses to compete. We project legalization will create tens of thousands of jobs, provide new opportunities for communities that have been most negatively impacted by prohibition and allow Minnesotans access to a variety of quality cannabis products currently being purchased in an unregulated black market. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Anderson. The next person is Chris Wright. Uh, please uh, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Chris Wright, Grassroots Party uh, Chair. Uh, Chairman Nor Nor and members of the committee, thank you for considering my testimony on HF 600. Uh, when it comes to defending our fragile democracy, restoring citizen control of government and reigning in corporate power, we are in the fight of our lives. In Article 13, Section 7 of the Minnesota Constitution, it says any person may sell or peddle the products of the farm or garden occupied and cultivated by him without obtaining a license. Therefore, in 1935, Governor Floyd B. Olson and the Minnesota legislature defrauded Minnesotans of their right to cultivate, sell, and peddle cannabis without requiring, uh, by requiring a pharmacy license in order to criminalize cannabis. Uh, that same year, they legalized alcohol, one of the most destructive drugs known to man. Ironically, in 1988, DEA Judge Francis L. Young 
described cannabis as the safest therapeutically active substance known to man. If government won't obey the law, then why should the public? Why foster contempt for, for law? Instead of correcting this historic constitutional injustice, HF 600 intends to perpetuate this fraud. If I had to support one fraud over another, Minnesota gets more justice from Representative Winkler's legalization by fraud than it does from criminalization by fraud, since both require an unconstitutional license. This is the only reason I support HF 600. With the right amendments, this could be a good bill. Uh, will you restore citizen control of government and restore our constitutional rights? Will any of you offer any of the amendments? Mr. I Wright, if, if you can wrap up your testimony, I'll appreciate that. Sure. Well, uh, there is no equity if, uh, if only the uh, wealthy investors and, and the, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> if only wealthy investors can uh, sell and peddle, uh, excluding the poor and the sick and so on. The only way we can get equity is by restoring our rights under Article 13, Section 7. Mr. Chairman, the hearings on this bill are important and historic. I urge adoption of my amendments and to consider my extended remarks. Thanks. Uh, thank you. The next person is Liska. Please welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair, unfortunately, they had to step off and they uh, are not on the call anymore. Uh, thank you. The next person is uh, Max Tartz. Uh, please welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Please uh, proceed. So hi, like you said, my name is Mike McStott, and I, uh, I work for a company here in uh, St. Cloud, Minnesota called Granite City Jobbing. Uh, we're a family-owned company that has been in the distribution business since 1968, and we distribute thousands of products to shops here in Minnesota and all over the upper Midwest. One of the product categories that we distribute is CBD, which is a cannabis-based product derived from hemp. CBD product sales for our company have grown by over 400% in the past three years, and uh, about four years ago, we weren't selling to any shops, and now we sell to over 600. If, if it's working like this for us and, you know, in our business, I can only imagine what it's doing for other businesses all over the state. Cannabis legalization will have many benefits, but the most important may be the economic benefit. We all know uh, it's been a, a very difficult year with COVID, civil unrest in our state, and economic uncertainty. We as a company have personally lost dozens of our retail partners that couldn't afford to keep their doors open in this past year from Thief River Falls to Bemidji, all the way down here to St. Cloud, Rochester, Albert Lee, and hundreds of cities in between. I see cannabis as a glimmer of hope that can absolutely help us to begin repairing this state, repairing our great city of Minneapolis, and help many of our business owners and their employees. I'll close by saying that I've been very lucky to live a life of relative privilege, but I'm also very, very motivated by the economic gaps that exist in this state. Immigrants and black and minority operators represent about 90% of our current retail partners here at Granite City. I'm thinking about people like Cotter and Andre and Asir and Kamira and all of the different strong men and women that have worked extremely hard to build their businesses here in Minnesota. And a vast majority of these people fully support cannabis legalization. I see cannabis as an opportunity for these people and their businesses to thrive once again. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you so much. We have the last uh, three testifiers and we'll get uh, uh, the time for the members to ask questions. Uh, Roxanne uh, Didrick, I believe that's the next person. Please welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hi, I'm Roxanne Diedrich. Um, I am owner and partner at Envirostar. We are based out of St. Cloud, Minnesota. We, are, we started out as a spray drying manufacturing company and we now provide spray drying ingredients. For the last four years, we've been working very closely with hundreds of cannabis companies across the United States and across the world. We, we've, been, we've been an R&D facility for them. They, lots of extractors send us their CBD material and then we turn around and we create water dissolvable powders and water miscible liquids and send it right back to them. I'm here to talk about how much money me personally as a company sends out of this state every single year. Even this week, I'm, we are packaging sample material and we're spending $10,000 out of state 
just on sample material. Uh, it's money that we're basically giving away. And it's the auxiliary, auxiliary companies that we need in Minnesota will be huge for the cannabis industry in Minnesota. We need packagers. We need, we need suppliers. We need distributors. We need people to fill lounges, hopefully that will, you know, sir, it'll also be a service in industry. Hopefully we'll see this be like, we're talking about the craft brew industry or the wine industry. We'll have lounges where people will go and congregate again, hopefully someday <laughs> if we ever get there. And we've, we've been seeing this. I have equipment uh, across the world right now in Hawaii, Japan, Colorado, Michigan, Florida, and we, we send so much money out of state on cannabis that we really can bring into Minnesota. Um, I'll use Michigan as an example. Michigan was one, one of the most recent to legalize, and last year... Ms. Dietrich, if you can wrap up your testimony, please. Oh, okay. That's it. I'm fine. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. The next person is Sally. Thank you. Mr. Uh, well, welcome yeah. to the committee and introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Evan Salee. I am the CEO and co-founder of Fair State Brewing Cooperative, uh, Minnesota's first cooperatively owned brewery. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I come to you today as uh, an experienced manager in a thriving locally based craft business because I believe uh, this bill will improve our economy in Minnesota and it will mis uh, mitigate the historic wrongs of our existing policy. Uh, the most important part of this bill is that will it, it will end the injustice that sees countless nonviolent Minnesotans whose futures are derailed by our current, current system. Justice simply demands that we end these practices immediately. Uh, however, what I really want to speak to you guys about is the important ways that this bill is structured to build a more thriving economy in Minnesota. Uh, our industry, the craft beer. You're muted. Uh, you're muted if you can unmute yourself and uh, complete your testing. Our, uh, our, our story here uh, in craft, our craft beer industry here in Minnesota has been one of success in spite of our laws. Uh, it's shown the power of small craft industries to improve our communities. Our industry has demonstrated a remarkable capacity to bring good and exciting jobs to communities of all sizes in every corner of our state. Uh, and these are really good paying jobs. Uh, our, here at Fair State, every single one of our employees makes a living wage. Uh, and I know that we treat our employees uh, in a really, really uh, forward looking and uh, high manner. And this is uh, one thing that I think our industry is known for and is certainly getting better for. Uh, our industry has also brought new vibrance to once flagging downtowns and brought uh, communities together in a new way. This work bill, uh, this bill builds on these models by encouraging a craft uh, cannabis industry in Minnesota that folks throughout our state will benefit from. It'll All create right. great jobs. Please, and it'll, please wrap up uh, your uh, testimony. Yeah. So, and it'll do right. it'll do so in a way uh, that'll help those who have been harmed by the injustice of our current policy. Uh, starting a business is very difficult, and the deed programs envisioned in this bill will go a long way towards clearing this, the path for small business to get off the ground and flourish. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. The last uh, testifier, but not the list, is uh, Mr. Ginsberg. Please welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank and then we'll be followed by majority leader uh, for response. So thank you. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Elliot Ginsberg. I'm an attorney in, in Minneapolis, and I represent small businesses. I'm here to urge your support for House File 600. I've been representing Minnesota craft breweries for nearly a decade and local craft cannabis businesses for the past few years. And what I've seen on the brewery side is that when given the opportunity, people, entrepreneurs step up and not just for profit, but also to build a sense of community. If you've ever been to a tap room, you'll see menus for local restaurants. You might find opportunities to volunteer for local nonprofits. And craft breweries often work with service providers that are based in Minnesota, whether it's architects, designers, lawyers, marketing firms. And that is what is presented here today is an, top, is an opportunity to create an, a completely new industry that provides some of the same benefits, only perhaps on a grander scale than we see on the brewing side of things. Uh, what 
is most important about this bill is that it emphasizes the importance of social equity. Uh, the basis for marijuana prohibition or for cannabis prohibition is based in racism, pure and simple. Um, this prioritizes licenses for social equity applicants in disproportionately impacted communities, which is something we can do to at least mitigate some of the harm done. And it, prior, and it provides grants for job training, helping people navigate regulations and startup loans to businesses in an industry where capital is otherwise hard to secure. So this will benefit many Minnesotans and their communities, and I urge a yes vote. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to all who testified uh, on this bill. Uh, Majority Leader Winkler, uh, any statement on the testimony? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would prefer to give members an opportunity to ask questions. Thank you so much. Uh, the first person is Representative Baker. Please uh, proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've just got a, maybe a few questions for the author of the bill. Um, Representative Winkler, uh, is, and I know we want to keep this focus to employment issues and labor and that kind of thing. I noticed party agreement has what's called the labor peace agreement. I want to understand that. I know you're not requiring um, a uh, manufacturer to be labor union organized, but what I see in the bill is that if they are organized, they cannot go on a picket or a strike or leave their work. Is that, am I reading that incorrectly, uh, Representative Winkler? Majority Leader Winkler. Mr. Chair, Representative Baker, uh, we did discuss that in the Labor Committee. A labor peace agreement is a pretty standard uh, provision uh, that is negotiated out between labor organizations and the employer. Essentially, they agree on the front end that if it, by signing the labor peace agreement, uh, that they will abide by the, the terms of it. And so, uh, it is uh, a, a common uh, form of uh, respecting the ability of workers to organize, uh, but limiting the potential for industry disruption because of strikes or lockouts. Representative Baker. Wow, I didn't realize that. Thank you for that. I, I didn't uh, know that that was even in existence in any conversations about uh, you know employee rights and their right for uh, to be heard within employers and you know disrespectful pay. Uh, second would be uh, the license fee. I see a, a $250 fee for a license. Um, I want to take you back a couple of years with my friend and colleague, Representative Olson. Uh, we had to work really, really hard with the pharmaceutical companies to raise their fees of selling pharmaceutical uh, scheduled drugs in Minnesota from $265 to a minimum of $5,000. And as you saw, and again, I, and I appreciate your, your support on that bill before too, uh, Leader Winkler. That was a lot of work to get it to move from 265 to 5,000 if they sold opioids and, and scheduled drugs. You want to kind of do that same thing here. And I'm just curious about your, your methodology about why keep it so low and so easy for people to sell a, a, a scheduled drug in Minnesota. Why is it starting so low with that license fee? Majority of the Mr. Chair, Representative Baker, uh, what we're trying to do and, and is to migrate an illicit marketplace into a legal regulated marketplace. So we want people to want to buy through licensed retailers. We want people who are currently in the cannabis uh, business or who are interested in being in the cannabis business to do it in a legal regulated marketplace. So we're shifting where consumers are buying. Uh, that means that we don't want taxes to be too high and we don't want regulatory uh, burdens to be too difficult to navigate. Uh, because that creates a barrier, and we've seen that in other states. Uh, we've seen, for example, in California, where the illegal marketplace is still four times the size of the legal marketplace. So by, and the $250 you reference is an application fee. There is actually zero license fee once you have acquired the license, and the taxes that we are levying are at the retail side only. Um, and we have, our, you know, we'll discuss this further in the tax committee, but essentially we want to not overtax this product so that we can shift uh, over to a legal uh, marketplace. So think about it this way. If it's easy to use established Ill illegal uh, market uh, uh, pathways to sell and, and buy cannabis, people will continue to do that if it's, not, if it's too difficult through the legal marketplace uh, because we have a well-established illegal marketplace. Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I, I caution that it would make sense then to make driver's licenses free and not cost to people and other things like that. But I challenge the, the thinking on that to make it free for folks to do this. And my final question, I guess, Mr. Chair, to, to Representative Winkler, um, 
is that uh, as an employer now, I if I have a, a uh, worker come to work and I think is under the influence, according to your bill, I have to I cannot terminate them if they take a test and it and it and it shows that they are positive of a, of, a, of marijuana. Uh, but if it I can't terminate because I have to have a second test to verify that. You know, we've we've come a long way with testing in Minnesota. The COVID testing doesn't work that way. If I'm if I'm dinged with a with a positive test, there's no second chances. Why is that different in this in this rule for an employer, uh, knowing that they could hurt themselves or others on the line, like we've heard from other testifiers today? Why are you making it so difficult for employers to have to do a second test in order to keep their workplace safe? Majority leader. Mr. Chair, Representative Baker, I think actually, unfortunately, I think there is some confusion about the testing provisions in this bill, and some of the testimony we heard today was not accurate. If you, for example, have a safety-sensitive position in your business, uh, you can have a essentially zero-tolerance position on cannabis, just like you can on any other uh, a drug that could put you under the influence. So anything that is safety-sensitive, anything that is regulated by the federal government, like in transportation, uh, is, continues to be regulated by the federal government. What the bill does is create a system where, and this is, would be true for uh, any other kind of uh, substance that can affect your mood. If you are uh, under the influence or are, you are in some way uh, um, unable to effectively perform your duties at work, the employer can then get a test. What the bill does not allow you to do is to have a screening for all employees at all times for any cannabis in your system and then use that as a bar for employment. So it sets up a two-step process. You have to, assuming it's not safety sensitive and that it's consistent with your workplace uh, 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 manual, the, the code of conduct that you write as an employer, if it's consist as long as it's consistent with that, you have to be impaired and you have to test positive for cannabis. So it's not two tests, it's, it's just a two-step process. The next question is, did you have a follow-up by Representative Becker? Oh, uh, Representative Frankie. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Leader Winkler. Um, you know, I was going to try to limit the scope of my questions, but I'm with some of the testifiers and um, where my passion lies. I guess I'll, I'll try to keep it to jobs, and I'll put it this way. Um, Leader Winkler, uh, my question would start off by asking, will this bill be making a stop in the Behavioral Health Committee? Majority Chair Wink. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Frankie, certainly the bill will make uh, a stop in a health committee. I am not sure yet which or how many health committees it will uh, be in front of. Representative Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I will go on to a, a more of a comment then after that question. I, I would like to see it in the Behavioral Health Committee. Um, and, and pertaining to jobs, I see that, you know, um, and I will let you know right off the bat, Majority Winkler, to show my commitment to where this is gonna be going and the discussions I wanna have with this bill going forward. Um, I will vote this bill out of this committee affirmatively, um, but I don't know about afterwards. I see some of the jobs that we're gonna grow um, with this bill someday going forward are gonna be within the substance use disorders, um, mental health, um, things like that. And, and I think we need to have some serious discussions around that. Um, and I'm willing to have those discussions. Um, I took a little bit of offense when a doctor said that cannabis is not addictive. Um, I'm here to tell you firsthand knowledge, cannabis is addictive. And I am willing to have those con conversations. Um, so I make that commitment to you, Representative Winkler, Leader Winkler, and to the people of Minnesota. Um, going forward, I think that uh, we need to have these discussions. Um, I would really like to see it in our Behavioral Health Committee. Um, and we, I think all of us know that this will not pass this year. So maybe not this year, but next. Um, but I am making this commitment to you to work with you on this language revolving around the substance use disorders and um, the jobs and the growth on the side of the mental health capacity, almost burdensome, it's gonna be right off the bat. And I, from what I've read in this bill, I think we need to take a better account and a larger investment in that area going forward. Um, and those are my comments. And, and I, I hope to hear from you 
at some point on this, Leader Winkler. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, Representative Frankie, I appreciate your comments and I'm very happy to work with you. In fact, we continue to have conversations with organizations related to substance uh, use disorders and understanding the need for them to have adequate funding for the work that they do. Uh, and so as we approach health committees uh, where we will dive into those in greater depth, I'm uh, more than happy to work with you on amendments to the bill, some of which we already have planned and I think you probably would support. Uh, I, I do just, and I know this is not the topic of the committee, I just think it's important to, to distinguish between uh, substances that are uh, it's possible to abuse and to um, use uh, to excess and those that are physically addictive. Uh, and, and that's the distinction between uh, different ways of defining the word addiction with respect to cannabis. Uh, thank you, Majority Leader Winkler and uh, Representative Frankie. The next person is uh, Representative John Griffiths. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, a few questions. Uh, first one is driving under the influence of alcohol is determined by blood alcohol content, content of 0.08 or greater. Uh, what's the equivalent for driving under the influence of marijuana and where in this bill can I find that? Majority Leon Winkler. Mr. Chair, Representative Jorgens, alcohol is highly unusual as a substance that can affect your level of impairment. There is a very high correlation between a specific measurable blood alcohol content and the, and the level of impairment for people. Um, cannabis is very different and is similar to other kinds of mood altering substances in the sense that the amount that it takes to affect your uh, level of uh, ability to drive a car, for example, varies greatly by individual. And so there is really little correlation between the amount of THC in your body and your level of impairment. Um, what's, I think, important to note is that is also true for other kinds of legal substances that can impair your ability to operate a motor vehicle. So I think it's, in this case, it's not, it, in reasoning by analogy, assuming that what's true of alcohol should also be true of cannabis is simply not the case. What we do in this bill related to driving is to train, and provide funding for training for drug recognition experts, uh, police officers who are trained to recognize impairment. Uh, similar to the way that they would recognize impairment for other kinds of uh, prescription drugs or because you're overly exhausted or for any other reason that can make you uh, less safe behind the wheel. Thank you, uh, Leader Winkler. I just wanted to make sure that we focus on Article 4, which is the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, we have a few minutes left and I'll be Mr. asking- Chair, Mr. Chair, in all due respect though, the testifiers were talking about the bill in general. So I think that we, have the same purview to be able to talk about the bill in its entirety too. So uh, thank my, my thank follow you, up question. Go ahead, uh, I will be adding an additional five minutes just to make sure that we vote this bill out of the committee. So go, go ahead, Mr. Jogger. Well, actually, Mr. Chair, I move that we lay house file house, uh, 600 on the table and I request a roll call. A uh, motion has been requested by Rickers Jones to lay this bill to the, uh, on the table. Uh, that is uh, a motion. Uh, the, uh, any dis uh, there's no discussion. I'll ask the, uh, the clerk, uh, Mr. Chavez, to take the roll. Justin Chavez, please take the roll on the motion to lay the bill on the table. Oh, sorry, I'll speak to myself. I didn't know I was on you. Chair North? No. Vice Chair? No. Okay. Vice Chair Jay John? No. Lead Hamilton? Aye. Lead Hamilton? Aye. Baker? Baker, aye. Baker, aye. Dabney? Daphne, no. Daphne, no. Frankie? Frankie, aye. Frankie, aye. Greenman? No. Greenman, no. Haley? Haley, aye. Haley, aye. Jurgens? Jurgens, aye. Jurgens, aye. Cagle? No. Cagle, no. Katiza Watoon? Katiza Watoon, no. Katiza Watoon, no. Olson? No. Olson, no. Tujong? No. Two John, no. Mr. Chair, uh, five eyes, eight no's. The motion did not prevail. 
Uh, the motion does not prevail. Uh, to the, the, the motion before us, members, I have represent uh, Ellie. Uh, I, I, can I continue with my questions, Representative or uh, Chair Noor? Go ahead, be brief, and uh, I think we shall focus on Article 4 so that we can uh, wrap the committee hearing today. Go um, ahead, Representative Jones. Well, we've heard testimony that the number of Minnesotans that are incarcerated for marijuana crimes, of, of those that are incarcerated, do we know what percentage agreed to plea bargains in those, in those cases in exchange for dropping charges for guns, robberies, or other uh, more serious crimes? Again, that is uh, not in, the, in our jurisdiction. I'll allow uh, Leader Winkler to respond. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Jurgens, obviously the impact, the, the um, public safety impact, the incarceration impact of uh, our current prohibition policy is discriminatory. Uh, and as we um, uh, have put this bill forward regarding expungement of crimes and release from prison, uh, if you have a, a misdemeanor or a gross misdemeanor for a cannabis only charge, it will be expunged and you would be released if you're incarcerated or and you would be released from any kind of parole or probation. If it is a felony level or higher, uh, it's an individual assessment based on the uh, particular individual's record for expungement and release. Representative Jorgens, any follow-up? Uh, yeah, are, are the programs fund that uh, uh, are funded in the A11 amendment, were any of those included in the governor's budget? Representative uh, Majority Winkler. Mr. Chair, Representative Jorgens, uh, I, no, they were not. Okay, and just one last one, uh, Chair Noor. Uh, this bill would permit flavored cannabis products for uh, individuals 21 or over. Um, and it's argued that, that the flavored tobacco products are encouraging the youth to smoke or vape tobacco products. Wouldn't the same hold true for flavored cannabis products? Mr. Chair, Representative Jorgens, as I have said at every committee this bill has been heard in, we are going to address the flavor issue in the health committee and we already have an amendment drafted to take care of that. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there was some discussion about uh, transportation and truck drivers and Leader Winkler. Uh, I'm still not clear um, that an employer uh, is limited in your bill and their capability to um, test somebody's impairment. And specifically, when we're talking about uh, you know the manufacturing sectors that every company frankly has delivery vehicles and and truck trucks doing delivery and i'm also concerned about school bus drivers frankly school uh you know drive trucks um so who who is liable then if some if there's an accident and uh you know somebody is harmed um how does the employer protect their liability if they don't have the means to um accurately test impairment or uh, use that as a basis for hiring or firing an employee. Majority Winkler. Mr. Chair, Representative Haley, every employer has an obligation to have workplace policies that reflect the needs of their workplace. So if you have uh, safety sensitive positions such as uh, drivers or high tech manufacturing uh, or heavy machinery, uh, then in that case, uh, the work, the employer should have policies that uh, prohibit anyone from being impaired or having uh, cannabis or alcohol or any other kind of substance in their system. Uh, and so in that case, if the employer fails to have a policy in place or fails to enforce the policy and the employee uh, engages in that activity and somebody's harmed, then the employer is liable. The, the employer has certain obligations. The bill doesn't remove any obligations or rights that the employer has. It simply requires that the employer's policies uh, reflect the fact that cannabis would be a legal substance similar to other kinds of substances that people can legally consume, but can affect their ability to uh, operate machinery or do other things uh, in a uh, impaired manner. Uh, thank you, Leader Winkler. Um, I think that uh, there still are, are so many concerns from the manufacturing sector, from the uh, uh, SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Management, on one, the testing capability for impairment for this drug. And again, the, the frequency and the liability, the, the opportunity for the employers um, to test and, and have reasonable assurance that the testing uh, works and is accurate. You said yourself that levels of impairment with this drug vary um, dramatically uh, based on individuals. 
Uh, so that is really one of my major concerns with this, and I think a lot more work needs to be done. Um, I, I know our, our lead, Mr. Hamilton, wants to ask some questions, so I'll stop for now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the last person on the list is uh, Lead Hamilton. Please uh, proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll respect the time. Um, my first question, uh, Representative Winkler, I guess my only question, has Deed taken a position on this? Because I know there's going to be dollars that are requested from the account that Deed oversees. Are they for or against this bill? Majority Leader Winkler. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hamilton, uh, Deed has offered technical assistance in drafting the bill. Uh, the governor generally supports cannabis legalization, and we work closely with him and the agencies to make sure this bill fits with agency uh, directives, policies, and uh, administrative ability. Lead Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Leader Winkler. Um, you know, my personal position or my political position on this um, uh, is I've supported the hemp program. I was the chair of agriculture when uh, Representative Kahn teamed up with Representative Franson. And uh, we at state uh, developed uh, the hemp program that's uh, very successful and continues to uh, head in a very positive direction. Um, I also supported the, the medical cannabis program. Uh, when uh, former representative Carly Moline was carrying that bill, I worked very closely with her uh, to use the term cannabis, cannabis versus marijuana for personal reasons around there. Um, unfortunately, uh, with this, uh, during the campaign season, uh, this is brought up quite a bit on the campaign trail for me, and I did say that I will uh, oppose this measure. Um, listening to the testimony, Representative Winkler, Leader Winkler, and uh, Mr. English uh, touched on this, and Ms. Rasmussen, I believe, touched on this. When it comes to uh, um, decriminalization and expungement, I'd be open to something uh, around that moving forward. Uh, but right now, I'm in no vote on uh, full legalization. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's the end of my questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lead Hamilton. Uh, to Majority Leader Winkler, any closing statement before we take the vote? Mr. Chair, uh, Representatives, uh, thank you for your time today. We have a cannabis industry in Minnesota today. It is unregulated. It is uh, dangerous for many people, and it creates deep inequities along racial lines in Minnesota. By passing this bill, we would actually create a legal regulated marketplace that creates opportunities and jobs for Minnesotans, and I would ask for your support today. Uh, thank you. Uh, I renew my motion, uh, House File 600, as amended to be re referred to Agriculture Policy and Finance Committee. Uh, the committee legislative assistant will take the role. Chair Noor? Aye. Chair Noor, aye. Vice Chair Jay Zhang? Aye. Vice Chair Jay Zhang, aye. Lead Hamilton? No. Lead Hamilton, no. Baker? Baker? Fine, you got to keep, you got to keep. Dabney? Two and three. Two and Dabney three. votes aye. Dabney votes aye. Frankie? Aye. Frankie, aye. Greenman? Aye. Greenman, aye. Haley? Haley, no. Haley, no. Jurgens? Jurgens, yes. Jurgens, yes. Cagle? Yes. Cagle, yes. Kadilatoon? Aye. Kadilatoon, aye. Olsen? Aye. Olsen, aye. Tujong? Aye. Tujong, aye. Baker? Baker? Not present. Mr. Chair, the motion prevails. One. What about the numbers? 10 ayes, two noes, and one abstain. Would the, uh, would the motion uh, prevail, uh, Representative uh, Winkler, Leader Winkler, you're, you are on your way. Uh, members, we don't have uh, any other matters uh, before us. Uh, this was the last bill. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we will see each other on Friday at 1 p.m. So thank you so much. The, the meeting is now adjourned.